All right, grab your Bibles now and open up to Acts chapter 7. We begin in verse 17. What's in your basket? What are you, what are you ready to click purchase on here today? Uh, we remember uh, this portion of the book of Acts uh, is a, a message from Stephen to the Sanhedrin or to the Jewish leaders who were so angry at what he was saying that they, they wanted to have him killed by the time he was done speaking. You might feel the same way toward me today. Uh, but with that, uh, let's, uh, let's study this portion of Scripture uh, as uh, Stephen, uh, by the Holy Spirit, as he's preaching this message, uh, exposes the idolatry of the children of Israel. Uh, they, yes, they were dead set on continuing their dead religion. Last week, we considered consider the folly of defending dead religion at the expense of an, a, real, an, a real vibrant relationship with Jesus, just kind of going through the motions. And in a further manner, uh, the passage before us today, Stephen puts his finger on the idolatry of the, the heart that was behind all of this movement in, in the nation of Israel. So let's, let's just take a, a minute and pray. We're going to actually look at verses seven, uh, chapter 7, verses 17 through 53. So it's a big passage of, of Scripture, uh, but so many uh, neat nuggets within this. We'll conclude the book, uh, cl- sorry, the chapter next week, uh, verses 54 through 60, the actual martyrdom of Stephen next week. Well, if your Bible's open here, Acts seven 17, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. We do pray for your blessing on our, our kids at youth camp. And uh, Lord, we just want to commit each of their hearts to you, that they would know you and walk with you, serve you. Heavenly Father, I just want to also pray for your work in each of our hearts here today. I'm thankful that you're able to speak that you're able to set us off by ourselves at times as though we're the only one in the room and you just open your word to us so faithfully. And we ask that you do that even now by your spirit, that we'd see Jesus, that we'd be beckoned to be a worshiper. Lord, we love you and we give you this time now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, what's the last high dollar item you purchased? I imagine you had options, right? You weighed the pros and cons, considered the cost, made your selection, and forked out the dough. <laughs> well, let me ask you, how, how's it going? Uh, any regrets uh, with that? Uh, In reality, in truth, every one of us every day makes a priceless and precious uh, purchase. We expend our time. We choose to give our time, our energy, our heart, our mind, our soul, our strength, to someone or something. So every every day, we make a precious, priceless, high value purchase every day. The famous words of Joshua, the leader of, of Israel into the promised land come to mind. Choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the God's on the other side of the river are the gods of the land of Canaan. If idolatry is your thing, you'll have no lack of options. <laughs> or the one true God of heaven. And he, he finished that, you know, as for me and my house, we've made a choice to serve the Lord. So, you know, I, I, I know that we don't always wake up with that mentality. We're not always actively, mindfully weighing the pros and cons of my actions today. I'm not considering the options I have before me. I might not always be counting the cost. But indeed, every day we make a selection. And we hand over our precious resources of time and energy and of heart and of mind and of soul 
and of strength. And as you have been purchasing on a daily basis those high value items, I ask you again, how is it going for you? Any regrets? Would you wish you would have spent your life on something other than you have? So again, the gauntlets laid down today in this text before us. Who will we serve? Whom will you, you worship with your life and resources? Uh, to whom will you go with your sorrow? Whom will you love with your heart? And so here in Acts chapter 7, Stephen puts his finger on idolatry. We remember Stephen's ministry. He was one of the deacons chosen to serve, but he was also a gospel preacher. And he was confronted in his gospel preaching. So that brings us to Stephen's message. A message to Jewish leaders who were accusing him of belittling Moses, the temple, and the law. Stephen, through an amazing and beautiful passage of Scripture in Acts 7, gives the whole history of the children of Israel. A long passage, the, the longest message in the book of Acts that we find. It's just the history of Israel where Stephen says, uh, no, if you were to examine honestly your history, you'd realize you have a tradition of idolatry <laughs> and of rejecting your leaders. And, uh, and so then the next week we'll consider Stephen's martyrdom. So Stephen's uh, ministry, uh, a deacon serving, preaching, Stephen's message, exposing the idolatry and uh, futility of dead religion to the Jewish leaders. Uh, specifically, they reject, their, they, they reject God-given deliverers. And then next week, Stephen's um, uh, martyrdom. Uh, but here we, we consider Stephen's message in further detail today. And here we pick up in verse 17. The second of two main deliverers that the children of Israel had rejected. First, Joseph. Second, Moses. And, uh, and then he'll also talk about their rejection of God as a whole. But in verse 17, he transitions from Joseph, who was the type of Christ, to Moses, who is the type of Christ. And so as we consider uh, this, this choice, you know, what's in our basket? What are we ready to click purchase on? Where should we be spending our time, our energy, our resources? We consider the good news first today, okay? Praise God for that. And we consider the, a Savior uh, clearly portrayed. This is who Jesus is. And this type of Moses that, that Stephen talks about reveals to us the heart and nature of Christ. So we're delighted to jump in right here at verse 17. And first thing we read is, as he says, but when the time of the promise drew near, and he's talking about how the children of Israel uh, had been sold, had gone into Egypt and 400 years of bondage in the Egyptians, uh, from the Egyptians, uh, this time of promise or the time of deliverance drawing near, that's the specific time that he's talking about. He says, but when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, 400, remember 400 years, they'd be in bondage. Uh, the, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. And then we read, till another king arose who did not know Joseph. The, the word another here in Greek is the word heteros or another of a different kind. This was a king that, was not, that did not have the same heart toward Joseph that the previous Pharaoh did. And so now they, there is this great uh, persecution, if, if you know the story of the book of Exodus, right? Verse 19, this man dealt treacherously with our people uh, and oppressed our forefathers. Remember, this is Jesus speaking to Jewish leaders, and they have the same history, of course. They're all Jews. And, and he made them expose their babies. Literally, uh, there was a command from the Pharaoh that they would take all the male babies and throw them into the Nile River. You remember that story, uh, so that they might not live, so that they would die. And then in verse 20, Stephen says, at this time, Moses was born. So let's just stop right there and, and consider Stephen is presenting this deliverer that was rejected. And the first thing we read about Moses is that he was a timely, a timely deliverer. Uh, at this time, verse 7, at this time in Israel's history, and that um, it was at this time of persecution, at this time, verse 20, Moses was born. So Moses was born at a precise time in Israel's history to be a deliverer for them. Who else was born at a right time or a precise time? 
Jesus was born at a precise time. Galatians chapter 4 tells us when the fullness of time came forth, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law. This reminds me of God's timing in general. And we can delight to know that if we're worshiping the Lord, we wor we're worshiping a timely God. You've heard of the old saying, the Lord is rarely early, but uh, or the Lord, although the Lord's never ate late, he's rarely early. Uh, what is it about our God that likes just to, he likes to wait just to the very last minute and do things the way that he likes to do things? Let's be honest with ourselves for a minute. While we're waiting on the Lord, what do we tend to do? Well, when mom comes home a little later when then she said she was going to come home, what do the kids tend to do? <laughs> we typically get in a lot of trouble while we're waiting. And that's, it's a reality in our hearts as Christians that oftentimes in the waiting, we are prone to idolatry. From a godly young girl waiting for a husband and the wait is longer than she wanted and may find herself in relationships that she didn't want to you, you name it, down the line. Waiting for fruitfulness in a ministry leads to discouragement and maybe even, maybe even a, a backing away from that ministry. I can just want to remind, I can just want, what is, that, what is that all about? Okay, sorry. I just want to remind you of this one thing this morning. Your God is a timely God. It's at this time, what time? What have you been waiting for? The Lord is a faithful God. And I think of what the Lord said to the children of Israel in Isaiah 40. He said, why would you say, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, or my just claim is passed over by my God? Have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. Even the youths will faint and grow weary and the young men utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up on wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They'll walk and not faint. Here that passage begins. Oh, my ways passed over by my God. How many times have you thought that? Because the Lord has you waiting, we mistake his waiting to act on your behalf as his lack of care for you. No, the children of Israel were in bondage in Egypt, but the Lord brought about a deliverer. And that deliverer is Moses. And Moses is a type of Christ. And you know what? The Lord also does amazing things in us and through us because he also calls us in certain seasons. And so not only is this a season where the Lord is maybe doing something new in you, but maybe he wants to do something new through you. As Mordecai said to Esther, who knows whether you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. The Lord does raise up deliverers to meet specific needs and specific times in human history. He's a sovereign God over all of it. And maybe he's doing something special in this time in your life. He's certainly a God that works in seasons. So not only is he a timely deliverer, and Moses was a timely deliverer, but Moses was a well-pleasing deliverer. And it's almost comical uh, at this time, Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God. But other passages tell us not only that he was well-pleasing to God, but that his, when, uh, like the book of Hebrews tells us, that when Moses was born, his parents saw that he was a beautiful child, and so they decided not to throw him into the Nile River. <laughs> it's like, oh, this is a cute baby. Like, <laughs> let's keep him. As though all the other moms were like, Oh, oh, like get, get, somebody toss this into the Nile River for me. Like, thank you for this command, Pharaoh. You know, it's not like, it's not like they thought that he was a beautiful baby. What parent doesn't think their baby is beautiful, even when you're like, yeah, great looking baby. Uh, <laughs> the word beautiful, both in Exodus and in Hebrews, has this idea that Moses' parents saw that there was something special about Moses that he was well-pleasing in their eyes, he was well-pleasing to God, that God had a special plan for this baby Moses. So he's put in a basket, found by Pharaoh's daughter, raised in the house of the Egyptians. The same could be said of the Lord. We have a well-pleasing God. Our God pleases the Father. Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well-pleased, the Lord said of him. 
And so it even, it even it is that we have to realize that the offer of salvation that the Lord has given to us is the best and most beautiful gift of all, his son, Jesus Christ. We all, so we read that when Moses was born, he was well-pleasing to God, and he was brought up in his father's house for three months. And, uh, but when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own. We remember the story, Miriam, the, the older sister was there. And, and we remember, amazingly, Moses' mo mother was then even paid to wean him, nurse him. Verse 22, uh, and Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Uh, one, uh, by considering Moses' education and his wealth and his privilege and his opportunity in verse 22, we consider something else about this deliverer in verse 23 on the heels of it. I mean, think of, uh, and this passage breaks Moses' life down into three 40-year sections. Uh, by the time you jump from 22 to 23, he's now 40 years old. Notice, now when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit the, his brethren, the children of Israel. I like that. I just came into his heart like, oh, oh, you know what I think I'll do? I think I'll leave behind all the riches of Egypt and go suffer with those Jews who are being brutally beaten every day. How did that come into his heart, right? God put it into his heart. God called him, called him away, called him away from a lavish lifestyle to choose suffering. And so we would consider this about this Savior, that he's a sacrificial Savior. First, let's consider Moses' example in this. Hebrews eleven twenty four 24 through 26 says, it was by faith Moses, when he became of age, I guess he became of age at 40 years old. That's hope for some of you young men here, okay? There's hope for me, I know. Uh, by faith, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So he refused a lavish lifestyle, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Don't you like that? But let's not kid ourselves. Sin is fun for a season. And the idolatry that we get ourselves into is enticing. That's why we get ourselves into it. But Moses said, I don't want to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. I'm weighing the pros and cons of my life. I can either throw my life away in moment, momentary pleasure day after day, week after week, year after year, decade after decade, or I can lay up for myself treasures in heaven. And so he esteemed, he weighed the pros and cons. He mentally, thoughtfully esteemed the reproach of Christ greater than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. The Lord Jesus urges us to do the same thing. Rather than living a life of emptiness and idolatry, wastefulness, to live a life that lays up treasures in heaven full of God's glory. And Jesus did that, did he not? He left, like the old hymn says, and can it be? You know, he left his father's throne above, so free and infinite his grace. He emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. And so the Lord left all. And I wonder, what futility, what sin are you willing to leave behind for something of far, far greater worth today, Christian? I hope that thrills your heart. And so he was a sacrificial savior. We look to that Lord, we follow that Lord, we worship that Lord. We embrace that, Lord, by living accordingly. And, and then it says uh, that uh, in verse 24, and so, uh, so then it brings up, brings up this, this first act when Moses said, you know what, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to be counted with the suffering rather than being uh, living lavishly. What is his first act? You, you, uh, remember, Stephen's sharing history, and you remember the story. Verse 24, Stephen recounts it here. And seeing one of them, one of that means one of his Jewish brothers, suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. Remember that he, he killed the Egyptian man and buried him in the sand. <laughs> and uh, then verse 25 says something that is a common misnomer among many of us. Uh, for he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand. 
But they did not understand. Oh, oh, that it would be that as Moses had supposed, verse 25. You hear what it's saying, right? Uh, when Moses struck the Egyptian, he just thought all the Israelites would be like, yay, Moses. He just supposed that they had all believed like, oh yeah, of course God's going to deliver us by Moses. Why wouldn't he? And it's that same kind of misconception when you leave all behind. You're like, I'm going to suffer with the people of God rather than enjoy the passing pleasures of sin and move my family to Africa. As though you show up on the shores and like, oh, it's the great white hope. And like they just suppose, like, they have, oh, yeah, of course God sent you here to us to save all of us. No, they don't think that way at all. It's the same thing in, in your mind, like whether you just want to get into your friends, your friend is struggling in marriage and they're, they're, you know, they're, they're really going through it. And you just think, oh, I'll get involved in this messy situation. As soon as I set up that first meeting with them or, or make that first phone call with them, hey, how you really doing? Kind of phone call that they're immediately going to say, oh, sure, surely this is the salvation that the Lord is sending me. No, they probably won't be very, they might not welcome your involvement at all. Remember, Jesus came to his own, and his own did not receive him. It's like making a phone call to a, to a handyman who's going to do some work on your property, and, you, and, uh, and he shows up in a time and wearing clothes you're not expecting him to, to be in, and, and he's, you just look outside, and there's some stranger poking around your property, and you're like, hey, get off my property. Like, who are you? Who called you? You're like, you did, you know? And the people all over the place are like, help, like something's going wrong, and then the Lord sends you, and they're like, they're like get out of here. Like, you, we didn't want you. You know what? We can all have that same response toward the Lord. Something's not right. Something's wrong. And it's like, it's Jesus that we need. Somebody points us to him. And, and we want to we reject not only them, but the Lord through them. If you're in that kind of situation, um, in, in the situation where you're really trying to reach a people that don't want to be reached or a person that doesn't want to be reached, just pray, be patient, continue at it. Don't give up on them. Let the Lord do what he's going to do in his time and in his way. If you grow frustrated or angry, it'll only hinder the process. Just be patient in it. In verse uh, 26, um, so here Moses will transition from that point to the next point in his life. Follow me with verse 26. And so as the next day, he appeared to two of them as they were fighting, and he tried to reconcile them, saying, man, uh, uh, you are brethren, why do you wrong one another? Uh, but he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Oh, and then Moses knew uh, the thing was known, you know, and so he fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian where he had two sons. <gasps> 40 more years past verse 30. We're just booking right along uh, through the life of Moses. Now he's 80 years old in verse 30. Uh, and when he was four, and when 40 years had passed, or a second 40, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. And so here's the famous burning bush passage. And when Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight as he drew near to observe the voice. And when he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him. So a burning bush gets Moses' attention. Not that a bush would never catch on fire in the desert, but there was something different about this bush. It was like a tumbleweed that had its own fuel. It was like a propane torch with great fuel and power. He's like, why is it not just burning up? Why does it continue to seem to blow forth amazingly strong heat? And so as he draws near, the scripture here tells us that it was an angel of the Lord, verse 30. And then in verse 31, it was the Lord who spoke to him from that place. Um, and... Uh, and even in verse uh, 33, the Lord, or the, the Hebrew word in the Old Testament is Yahweh. So who is the messenger from, who spoke to Moses from within the bush? I think the easy answer is God, but there's a more detailed answer to it. He's called both the angel of the Lord and then also Yahweh. So we know it's God, but specifically the angel of the Lord would refer to the second person of the triune Godhead or Jesus this was literally Jesus speaking to Moses from within the burning bush. And he simply says this, I am God, verse 32, 
the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Then Moses trembled. He dared not look. Moses' response was worship. Even the Lord aided in that by saying, take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. So that's a worshipful, reverential response. And then I have sur surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. Moses was deeply impacted by this meeting. Moses heard this. If we f consider the I statements of God, we understand the flow of the thought. I am God. I have seen. I have heard. I will send. Moses responded in worship. On the ground, sandals off. When it comes to idolatry in our life and why we pursue selfish pleasures is because there's some sort of oppression, some sort of groaning that we have naturally as humans. We live in a fallen world. People have sinned against us. We've committed sin we really would rather not think about. And in all our suffering, it is so much easier to go toward idolatry, instantaneous pleasure, rather than go to the Lord. But in a time of worship like Moses, we need to hear the Holy Spirit so clearly. I am God. I have seen your oppression. I have heard your groaning. And I have sent a Savior. The only means... And it's in that place of worship that, that everything is settled, where the wrongs we have done and the wrongs done to us are nailed there with him, there on the cross. And we realize he's the only means. Mo Stephen is trying to get that through to the Sanhedrin, who were fully rejecting Jesus at this time. And his point is, God sent Moses. And so he follows it up with verse 35, this Moses, whom they rejected, remember Stephen speaking to the Sanhedrin or the Jewish leaders, this Moses, whom they rejected or your forefathers rejected, saying, who made you a judge and ruler over us is the one God sent to be ruler and deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. You can see Stephen's point, right? Uh, Moses was rejected by the people, but he was the one God sent. And now you're rejecting Jesus, but he's the one God sent. Let that not be said of us as Christians, that we're rejecting the, our only solution. Verse 36, he brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the 40 years and in the wilderness, uh, or in the, in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. And so then he... he he backs that up after he said, this is that Moses, this Moses, was verse, verse 37 by saying, this is that Moses, and he's just reiterating his point, who said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren, him you shall hear. This is Stephen's pointing forward to Jesus by simply saying that Moses prophesied about another ruler. There you see it in verse 37. As Moses prophesied about another ruler coming, we know that that had both a near and far fulfillment. You know, most prophecies have a near fulfillment and then a far fulfillment. Who was the near fulfillment? Joshua. After Moses came another leader, Joshua would bring them into the promised land. But who was the far fulfillment of that? Jesus. And so Stephen's getting, starting to get through to these or make his point clear. I don't think he's getting through to them. <laughs> but he's getting through to these Jewish leaders. This prophet after Moses, Jesus, he's the one you need to hear. And then verse 38, this is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke with him on Mount Sinai with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give us. They had said, 
Stephen had rejected God's word, but here he calls it the living oracles and how we need to hear God's living words, right? In verse 39, uh, whom our fathers would not obey, but rejected. And then notice at the end of verse 39, and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. It's a sad commentary that when men are being brought out of bondage, the immediate results of coming out of bondage sometimes are so unfavorable that they desire to go back into bondage rather than stay the course. Some of the withdrawal symptoms of coming off of heroin can be so distressing that the only solution is, let's not get off the heroin. And, and, and there are withdrawal symptoms from so many things. Whether it's food is your idolatry or, or it's even just reading this, this last week of some of the withdrawal symptoms that can come upon a man when, when he is trying to overcome the sin of pornography and all of the depression and isolation and all of these things that can bombard his heart, no hope for the future as he's now a week or two weeks after walking away from this thing that he knows is killing him. But the distresses that have come along with repentance in his life are so great that he says, I think I'll rather just go back in my sin and go back into my bondage. And that was the children of Israel when they came out of slavery. Yeah, they were in the hot desert sun. They were receiving the law. What happened to Moses? He's up on the mountain. It's like they weren't necessarily easy times for them, but it was the best thing for them. And you know what? It's easy for us in our hearts to turn back to idolatry because now that we've put ourselves in the path of Christ, things aren't going splendidly enough soon enough. And so they turn to idolatry, verse 40, notice, saying to Aaron, make us gods to go before us. As for this man Moses, who brought us out of the, the land of Egypt, we do not know what beca have become of him. That's when Moses was up on the mountain for 40 days, 40 nights. So that, you know, they all made their gold. They, and verse 41, and so they made a calf. They brought their gold, their bracelets and earrings and all that. And they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifices to that idol, to the idol, and rejoiced in the work of their hands. And so they worshiped something that they could make. And idolatry is just foolish, isn't it? Let's think about what these Israelites did. They didn't know where Moses went. So logically, you would take your gold earrings and bracelets, melt them down, form them into a gold calf, and then say, you are my God who delivered me out of Egypt. What shall we do, right? Like, yeah, that's absolutely illogical. Um, in fact, I love, I love what Isaiah 44, 19 says. Uh, the, uh, um, there the prophet puts his finger on the idiocy of idolatry. And he says, no one, do, no one considers in his heart, Isaiah 44, 19, nor is there any knowledge nor understanding to say, uh, I have burned half of it in the fire. What he's talking about is a tree. A tree's already been the subject there. Somebody goes and cuts down a tree. They've burned half of the wood in a fire. Yes, I've baked bread on its coals. So they've used some of the, the wood uh, to bake food, you know, bake their bread on. And I've roasted meat and eaten it. And shall I make the rest of it an abomination or into an idol? You know, take some of that leftover wood, carve it into an uh, idol. Shall I fall down before a block of wood? <laughs> like, yeah, it sounds idiotic, right? Who would even do that? In fact, that's one of the most comical things that I see whenever I'm traveling in a Hindu or Buddhist country. And you see outside of somebody's shop or outside of somebody's house, this little graven image overlaid with some sort of cheap plastic gold kind of deal and uh, has eyes and hands and everything else. And you know what they do? They put food around it. So they'll actually get a can of Coke and crack it open, put a straw in it, place it there, get some crackers and open up the package and put it there. And, and then even some fruit, they'll peel the little orange and slice it and put the little slices there. Evidently, this uh, God of theirs can't uh, open a can of Coke or package of crackers or peel an orange. Um, but you know what else it can't do? It doesn't eat it. And they don't even, like, like, some, like you would think that at least somebody would go and eat it in the middle of the night. So they'd come like, hey, see, we satisfied our God. Like, like you know, Santa and the cookies or something. And dad's like, yeah, that was, that was pretty good. Uh, but it's just like idiotic. We'd say, who would even do that sort of thing? But you know what's something equally as idiotic? It's when you're in a coffee house and you look over the table and there's two girls sitting there. And they're not even talking to each other. They're just on their phones. 
And from a distance, you're like, what are they doing? Like, like interact. Look at the world around you. Or it's a family dinner and dad's sitting in his big chair and other, some people are talking and conversing, playing games, and he's just locked in on his phone. And you can look over and you see somebody just checked out and it looks so foolish, doesn't it? But when you're on your phone, it's like, like, whoa, the whole, like the whole world's opened up to me. This is exactly what I, somebody's trying to, shut up, don't, don't like, we don't even hear them. It's like idolatry on our end. This isn't an idolatry. This is living. And other people are looking at you like, that is so foolish. You name it, check in the, you know, put the God, in. you see somebody that's given over to a life of drunkenness or drug abuse, substance abuse, it just seems so idiotic. Somebody's gonna leave his wife for 40 years or 30 years or whatever and go marry another younger woman. It seems so idiotic, but in his brain there, that idolatry of that thing seems like this is living, but it's not. It's death. And you're going to pay for it. And these men were so idolatrous. And God turned and gave them up. Notice in verse 42, God gave them up to worship. And that's a sad deal right there, Christian. When the Lord gives us up. When we were singing that song, um, I've known you as a father and I've known you as a friend. I was thinking about father is like how loving God is as a chastening father. And I'm, and I'm so thankful for his chastening in my life. Now, nobody loves chastening. It's never pleasurable. It's always painful for the time. But afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruits of salvation to those who are trained by it. You know what is an absolute tragedy? When the Lord stops chastening us and stops convicting us and just gives us over it's what he's done with unbelieving humanity, Romans 1, through 25. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of an incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness, like just to practice their sins and the loss of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, uh, who exchanged the truth, truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. When we worship the gifts that God gives over the giver of those gifts, it's idolatry. When Paul the apostle even said covetousness is a form of idolatry. When we are looking at something and we think that something will make me happy, we've already committed idolatry in our own hearts. For it's not something, it's someone. And he's our savior and his name is Jesus. And he's the one we need and the one we should worship. And so there, in continuing midway through verse 42, after God gave them up to worship the host of heaven, he quotes from Amos 5. And you probably don't recognize this as Amos 5. Like, oh yeah, Amos 5. Love Amos 5. But anyway, he quotes from Amos 5. Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Molech and the star of your god Rephim, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away to Babylon. Well, if you are one of those Bible geeks and you knew that that was Amos 5 and you love Amos 5, then you would immediately be astounded by the last word Babylon there because you're like, that's not what Amos 5 says because Amos 5 says Assyria there, not Babylon. And what's the point? The point of the verse is that they didn't worship God. They worshiped false gods. And because of that, they were carried away. Amos 5 says Assyria. Here, Babylon. And the point Stephen's making, and yes, he by the Holy Spirit changed a word of Scripture to make it applicable to them in their specific situation. The reason Amos 5 says Assyria is because Amos was writing to the northern kingdom who went into Assyrian captivity. 
Stephen is addressing the southern leaders of Judah who previously had gone into Babylonian captivity. So that's why the switch of the name and the place. Essentially, Stephen was making it personal for them. And so let me give a couple suggestions, certainly not an exclusive list, of captivities that come from idolatry. Has secret sin left you isolated in social settings? Has substance abuse been, uh, uh, had its way in stressing personal relationships? Has your anxiety and constant worry made you an insomniac? Has an infatuation with social media riddled you with envy and pride, needing constant affirmation from others? Or, positively, has your worship of God filled you with joy and peace that results from a life of faith and obedience. Oh, whom we worship matters. What we purchase in this life, items, they either serve us well or serve us poorly. And I would put forth to you that where you invest your time and your energy your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength will produce either positive or negative dividends in your life. If you sow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And so as we uh, conclude our, our passage here, Stephen declares that God is not limited to one temple as they had accused him of coming against the temple, and he said, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, and as he appointed, you know, as he appointed, it's instructing Moses to make everything according to the pattern that it, he had seen. This is what we're going through in Exodus on Wednesday nights, so the building of the tabernacle. And then which our fathers, or the tabernacle, cloth tabernacle, having received it in turn, also brought with them, brought with Joshua into the land of promise by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David. So we're moving quickly up into the history, all the way up to David here. And still a cloth tabernacle. David didn't want the temple dwelling in, or the Ark of the Covenant dwelling in tents, the, the canvas tabernacle still, verse 46. Uh, but David found favor before God, and then he asked to find a dwelling place for Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. Again, another near and far fulfillment example. Solomon, the son of David, actually bought, built the temple of stone and brick and gold, uh, replacing the old tabernacle. Uh, uh, but Solomon, that was the near fulfillment, the far fulfillment as Christ, um, who is the tabernacle. And so Stephen's point is this. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. And what is the house that you will build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? Yes, these Jewish leaders who were determined to defend their dead religion needed to realize that they were missing Jesus in the process. And, and Stephen says, it's Jesus and he's greater than your temple. And so here's his application. After all of that history, he saved his application right for the very end. And here it is. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. <laughs> you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets and fathers did you not persecute? And they, and they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one. This is where Stephen preaches Jesus, if you're looking for it. The coming of the just one, whom you have now become betrayers. You betrayed him and murdered him, had him crucified. Uh, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. Oh, you neglected such a great salvation. You rejected your only means of salvation, which is Jesus. Uh, you, know what he, you know what he does here? As he says that you have had a long history of this. When he says you stiff-necked, he means stubborn. And then uncircumcised, that was the worst thing you could call a Jew, uncircumcised. He's saying your heart's uncircumcised, your mind's uncircumcised, you really don't know who God is. But this, you always resist the Holy Spirit. You always resist the Holy Spirit. That phrase that's found in verse 51 suggests a continuity of behavior, an ongoing pattern 
that they had in their relationship with God, that whenever the Holy Spirit would speak or put his finger on an issue, they would be stiff-necked and stubborn. And like I said, you might want the, their, re, their response is going to be, they were cut to the heart, they stopped their ears, they ran at him and they killed him. Like they said, enough is enough, shut up and stop talking and you might be feeling that very way toward me right now. But I cannot let you go until I speak this piece of truth that if there is an ongoing stubbornness in your heart and a resistance of Christ and his call for you to lay aside idolatry, whatever that certain thing may be, this is a moment for you, a time when a deliverer of sorts is the word that you've heard this morning has been sent to you. And the answer for you is simple. It's repentance from that idolatry, a turning from it, and it's a turning to the Savior. And it's, a give, it's you giving him your life full and free. The worship of God is not in a place, but it's in a person, and it's in Jesus Christ. And this is what he says. Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. It's amazing how you are so good at setting us by ourselves. And speaking so clearly to us in a timely fashion, in a gentle and loving manner, reminding us of your worth, your supreme worth over and above all else. And so, Jesus, we choose you this morning as we have a minute of sobriety right now before you. We Weigh the pros and cons. We count the cost. And we make a choice to turn from sin that grieves your heart and which hinders our lives and those around us. And we come to you, the merciful Savior, who died for our sin, rose again to give us life, who offers us, even right now at this very minute, free and full forgiveness, hope for the future. And Lord, in this moment of sobriety before you, we just make the choice to give you our lives, our time, our energy, our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength to worship you with all that we are. And Lord, we love you and have your way, whether it's the first time or uh, again and again that, that we've made that honest confession before you and, and honest submission to you. Lord, we, we just ask that you bless it as we depart, that we go out with joy and be led out with peace, uh, that you'd be our God and we'd be your people. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.